This is Times Radio. It's Ruth Davidson here with you until four o'clock. Now, do you remember all of this? And then we got it. It happened, didn't it, at the moment. The Remain vote is 56,000 and the Leave vote, 83,000. And we suddenly knew that something remarkable was going to happen. On a day when Britain's history altered course, the most famous clock in the land chimed 11pm here, midnight in Europe, the moment our trading relationship with the continent finally changed. We have our freedom in our hands, and it is up to us to make the most of it. You are fake news, because our country is angry and our country wants to be respected again. Hello, Texas. It's great to be back in this wonderful, beautiful state with thousands of proud American patriots who believe in family and freedom, God and country. And by the way, oil and guns. Do you think people are angry today? Absolutely, people are angry. And you can feel it. You can feel the, the rage, the madness. The world narrowly escaped a nuclear catastrophe last night. That's what the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. said today after Russian forces attacked and seized the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. I would like to tell you about the 13 days of war, the war that we didn't start and we didn't want it. We do not want to lose what we have, what is ours, our country, Ukraine. Well, the world today is a very different place to the one it was 10 or even five years ago. The global consensus of democracy and free markets seems to be collapsing before our eyes, from Brexit and Trump to the destabilised Middle East. Even before Russia invaded Ukraine, geopolitics has been underlying the political and economic stories which are defining our era. It may feel like we're at the end of times or the beginning of a new era, but the seeds of change were sown years ago, according to the new book by Professor of Political Economy, Helen Thompson. It's called Disorder, Hard Times in the 21st Century. I spoke to her about the book and how she went about unravelling the stories which have led to where we are today. And I started by asking her to explain whether we really are facing a world full of disorder. Well, it's the better way to think about disorder in a way is that it's more the norm than order is. So that we, we have periods... Are you telling me to embrace the chaos, Helen? <laughs> I wouldn't say it's necessarily chaos, and I and I don't, and I certainly don't want to get into a sort of nihilistic view of it, where you say you just like accept the chaos. I don't think that's true at all. I think that we need a better understanding of the disorder, um, because that's our best chance of being able to. That's our best chance of uh, of being able to manage it, to contain it. And so I think that what I would argue is is that you have periods of relative order. Let's say like the 1990s not all of the 1990s because i think quite often when people look back on the 1990s and see it as some kind of like golden age they forget that it begins with the balkan wars uh, uh and actually in the european union it begins um with you know considerable turbulence um in the in the european monetary um system but all the way through the 1990s there were still these some of these problems that i talk about in the book that are just kind of like there underneath the surface um, you know, there's a problem, for instance, um, as to what to do about Iraq um, after the first Gulf War. Um, the operation of trying to sort of contain it militarily and have sanctions, but with no fly zones and having and having sanctions that make it difficult for Iraq to sell oil. You know, th that stops Iraq, but you know, keeps Iraq out of Kuwait. But it's it's setting up a, a whole set of other problems that the United States will start trying to deal with when George Bush becomes president in, in 2001. And in lots of ways, you know, the seeds of the second Iraq war lie in the 1990s. And it so it's almost like you're saying that global leaders um, are making decisions tactically when they should be making them strategically. And there is a difference. And the tactical moves that they've made, particularly the US have made, have come back and bitten them on the backside. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a long and continuous story about the failures of the United States in the Middle East. I mean, I would say that those failures in some ways go back you know, like all the way to the aftermath of the First World War. Perhaps you could even say to the First World War um, itself. But that what happens is, is that the incoherences in a position, like let's just say in the American position towards the Middle East, is that it doesn't cause a lot of trouble for you know some substantial periods of, of, of time. Um, but it never really goes away. And then at moments of crisis, it really comes back to the fore. And then people turn around and say, well, we didn't really see that coming. Well, if you'd been sort of thinking about, in some sense, disorder as the norm, as part of a continuous history, but that that disorder not always having ex- causing explosions, then we will be caught less, um, we'll be less taken aback when we, ha- when, when we have to confront these um, problems. I guess sitting here in the United Kingdom, 43 years old, I didn't kind of realise that we were just at the top of the tree and we were very secure where we were. We didn't, I didn't appreciate it. But but it does seem like the sands are shifting, not just under our country, but uh, under a lot of Western Europe and the United States. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that we've been living in these sands, so to speak, if we're going to use that metaphor for a long time. In lots of ways, I think that we should have seen many things that have happening and that people experience as shocks coming. I, I don't mean to say we should have experienced, should have expected that Putin would have launched such a massive invasion of Ukraine, but I don't think it should have been surprised anybody really that he wanted to challenge the, the territorial borders of Russia, to change the territorial borders, borders of Russia. And that he, I mean, he's made it pretty clear that he regarded the dissolution of the Soviet Union as, as he puts it, the geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, and that he wasn't just going to um, take it in some sense that he wanted to use Russian power um, that was made possible by, in many ways, the um, energy boom that China created in order to recast the borders of Europe. Well, interestingly, the book starts on energy and, and how that is changing the way in which countries deal with each other. Um, and, you know, I hadn't really thought about it as much. I knew that we were in an energy transition. We were moving from oil and gas or renewables, et cetera, in this country. But but I hadn't really thought about how much of how other countries deal with each other is based upon these tradable kind of commodities, I guess. No, I think that it's, it's pretty difficult to understand the, the history, certainly the geopolitical history of the 20th century, and as a consequence of the 21st century, if we don't understand how important oil and gas um, are to the relations that countries have with each other. And when seismic changes happen, particularly in relation to oil, in, um, so for instance, in the, in the 1970s, when the United States stops being the world's largest oil producer, and first the Soviet Union, and then later Saudi Arabia become the world's largest oil producers, this is a big deal. And it has profound consequences, not only in the international sphere, um, but it has in, in, in democratic politics in countries like Britain and the, in the in the um, United States, we saw that in the 1970s, I think, pretty clearly. And, and, and then because for a, a while, energy markets got somewhat easier, I wouldn't say straightforward, but they got somewhat easier, it, it all got forgotten about. And then we all act shocked when energy comes to the fore again and we're dealing with you know, incredibly high prices and geopolitical turbulence around energy. Well, there's also the difference between um countries and countries' governments and, and their pursuit of energy, energy policy, and also the huge global environmental movement as well. And I, I guess the question for countries like the United Kingdom that had an energy revolution after it had an industrial revolution is, you know, you know, can we impose restrictions on countries like China, like Russia, that's wanting to have exactly the same energy revolution that we had, but just after we did it? Yeah, I mean, I think that we have to understand pretty clearly that the Industrial Revolution was an energy revolution, like first and foremost, there was no Industrial Revolution without that shift to coal um, taking place. And then there was a second energy revolution beginning really in the United States in the latter part of the 19th century and then spreading um, into other parts of the world, starting with um, Europe, but not only Europe, which was around oil. Um, and then we added gas to the mix, really, from the the, the 1960s. And for the countries that um, were the most successful economically during this time, the Western um, countries and, and and Japan and a few other other of the East Asian um, countries, but not actually China, 
And this made it possible for many more people to have much, much higher standards of living. So in some sense, then, when developing countries want to develop, what they want to do, what they're committed to is, is developing their energy consumption, because that what, that's what it means to have a modern economy, um, in some sense, to have high um, per capita energy um, consumption. But as we now understand, um, high per capita energy consumption has, when that energy is fossil fuels, has very, very serious ecological consequences. And so we're now looking at, at trying to have the same way of life using a different energy or using different plural energy sources, renewables and, and hydrogen, um, probably. But the magnitude of that change to say, OK, we can we, we can live the same way in which we do now in rich countries and poor countries can catch up with us so that they can have the same living standards. And we could do all this with different energy that sources than the ones that have made it possible in the first place. That's a, just like, it's, it's quite hard, to, I think, at times to find words to describe what a, a transformation that that would, would be. If net zero is successful by um, 2050, that would be an astonishingly, astonishing human achievement. OK, well, let's, let's move on from energy at the moment, because, like I say, I, I remember some very big upheavals in, in my lifetime. Um, the most visceral one for me is is, is 9-11 and mm. the security pivot that we had in the world in 2001. And you could, you know, you could see it. You could see the smoke coming out of the building. You could see the towers coming down. Um, the Arab Spring, you could see people that were out on the streets. You could see the protests that were happening in a way that we'd never seen before. Um, and I kind of assumed that that uh, democratic, that people power, that security element was going to be a bigger shift in how we read the world than the financial shifts that you talk about, because it's it's hard for individuals to see what happened in 2008. Um, but but your argument is that, that the financial system changes are absolutely more important or have had a greater, more profound effect than the security ones. Yeah, I mean, I think that's in part because if you look at the big two ruptures um, financial wise in terms of the international financial and monetary system, the first in the in the 1970s, um, when the Bretton Woods monetary system came to an end. And the second, as you say, in in 2008, the, the 2008 financial crash, or it's really the 2007 to 8 financial crash. Both of them have got a significant energy parallel story. You might say energy dimension, but at least an energy story that's running like parallel. Um, and let's just them. explain Bretton Woods, because like I say, I'm 43 Bretton Woods yeah. finished before I was born. Yeah. Um, that's when we didn't used to have exchange rates. We didn't used to trade currency like that. They were fixed. And then, yeah, well, basically, and then that the Bretton, went out of the window. Yeah, the Bretton Woods system was basically a system in which countries pegged their exchange rates against the dollar um, and that the dollar um, was convertible at a fixed price into, into gold. And it was the only currency that was then convertible into, into um, gold. And as this was changing we started to see countries led by the United States removing controls on capital. So now we were beginning to live in the world of international finance where vast sums of money could move across state borders, you know, with a click of a um, few clicks on a, on a computer screen and states weren't trying to control any longer the flow of capital. And then what happens in, in 2008 um, obviously, as we know, is is that the international banks um, are massively exposed um, to basically, to, uh, but massively exposed in the funding markets in which they borrow. It causes an almighty crash that has consequences for the whole of the rest of the uh, economies through the, the Western world and to some extent other parts of the world um, too. But one of the things that's important to to, to note about the, the the financial crash is is that it completely changed the monetary environment in which we now live, because this is the world in which central banks had to respond to the situation or chose to respond to the situation by by pursuing quantitative easing policies by basically, you know, in sort of more sort of. Um, schematic terms, perhaps printing money. It's not quite what they do, but it's a good enough description for um, what that they do. And interest rates have been extraordinarily low um, ever since. Now, there's lots of advantages that have come from this. I think that wouldn't have been possible to have the response to the pandemic economically that we did, and essentially closing down economy for months, supporting people um, to stay in employment by fur the furlough scheme. All that was dependent, I think, on the central bank simply being able to take care of borrowing for um, governments. 
but it's also had profoundly disruptive consequences um, as well. It's made it much harder, I think, um, for um, central banks to ensure any kind of monetary and financial stability. Well, that was Professor Helen Thompson there speaking to me about her book, Disorder. Up next, I'll speak to her about the future. Where are we heading? And is it towards even more chaos? This is Ruth Davidson on Times Radio. Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker, this is Times Radio. And this is Ruth Davidson with you on Times Radio, where I've been talking to Professor Helen Thompson about her book, Disorder. And I spoke to her about what the future holds. OK, so so future cast for us then. How do nation states, but particularly those um, that you talked about at the beginning, the US, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, um, some of the, the Far East countries um, that enjoyed that early kind of global richness, how do they manage disorder in a way which continues to see life expectancy grow, child mortality fall, standards of living rise, health outcomes rise, um, but without polluting? Well, I think in that sense, this is the question that we, you know, there's, you've put your finger on the, the question that ha, 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 has got to um, be faced. I mean, I think that we're looking at a politics where the consumption of energy is going to be significantly more difficult, like both in itself, in the sense that there are moments of crisis, I think we could expect to see energy rationing effectively again um, in Western countries. Um, you can already see that some West, some energy rationing was, was happening in China last um, autumn. It's happened in middle-income countries like Turkey, and I think it's probably in our futures at some point too. I think that there are ways in which we will have to face generally reduced energy consumption, and that can be voluntary reduced energy consumption. And some of that can be like by thinking much more carefully about energy efficiency and the way that we use um, energy and not um, wasting it. But I think the big question that the, 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 the governments that you just mentioned need to be need, need to be thinking about is how are they going to manage the politics of this, the politics of energy distribution? What are they going to do when energy prices are so high that they price poor people out of using energy? Um, are they going to subsidise that energy consumption? Are they going to ask pe people who are well off to bear more of the um, burden in the ways in which those subsidies um, might work? Are we going to move in terms of the energy transition? Um, let's say we're just looking at electrifying cars. Are we going to presume that actually it would still be possible to have a mass car ownership under those conditions? Or do we want to be thinking much more about creating public more, more more public transport and having fewer cars on the road? Well, these are huge questions that are, are facing the kind of political elites around the world. And I'm interested in the way in which you've talked about the way power is, is wielded. Um, and you've talked about uh, things like democratic excess and aristocratic excess. And can you just very briefly explain the terms and then we can have a bit of a discussion about why you think that what I would call hubris, but, but you call something else, is, is going to start bringing down some of these strong men around the world. Yeah, the basic idea of de of democratic aristocratic excess, I, I actually took from one um, uh, of the um, Greek historians who was right, late Greek historians who was like writing about um, the rise of uh, the rise of Rome, and his basic idea was that each form of government destroys itself over time, and that it destroys itself by having too much of itself. So democracies destroy themselves by being too democratic in the end. Aristocracies destroy themselves by being too aristocratic. And I think that there's something in this. But I started from the idea that actually in a representative democracy, so not the kind of democracy that Athens had where all the citizens you know, gathered to, gathered together, um, that actually representative democracy, there's something aristocratic about it because you have representatives who are chosen by the many and that there's something democratic about it precisely because the representatives are chosen by all the voters by or by um, all the, the citizens. So I started with the idea that representative democracy has got a propensity both at times to be too democratic 
and at times to be too aristocratic. I think that the propensity to be too have aristocratic excess in representative democracy is stronger than it is to have too much democracy. And that's partly because of the way in which modern economies um, work. And in terms of that, that kind of excesses then, do you see some regimes in the world that are looking like they're teetering on the point at which that excess will be the thing that undermines them? I think that the United States has like become has come closest to this, um, not because I think that American democracy is about to tumble over, but I think it would be quite difficult to imagine how a man like Donald Trump could have been president, could have become president of the United States in the manner in which um, he did without those, let's call them quite oligarchic features um, of American democracy, supposed democracy coming to the um, for uh, and that he was able to, albeit completely hypocritically, given his own um, position, sort of act as somebody who was saying, "Look how bad our democracy is. Look, some a man like me can be bought by, um, or I can buy the politicians." Sorry, is, is effectively what he was saying, and and, and 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 that's wrong. And these corrupt politicians aren't looking after your um, interests. Now, as I say, there's a lot of what Donald Trump was saying that was disingenuous and self-serving but I don't think it could have been able to have been as successful as it was as a strategy for winning votes without him being able to shall we say make some points uh, about the way in which American democratic politics had come to work. I mean he clearly harnessed the feeling there was an absolute yeah. wave of of whether it's part of the culture was whatever language you want to use there was absolute wave there and and I'm interested in the counterpoint between America and Russia, often which have seemed as if they're opposite sides of, of a same coin. And I'm interested in whether you think the very excessive aggression that Putin has just shown could be an excess that may bring down him at some point too. I think this is a really this is a really interesting question. And I don't pretend for one second to be um, a seasoned Putin you know, observer. Um, what I do think is that everything that he's done in terms of actions until this point has shown some caution. That isn't to say that it hasn't been aggressive, but he's tended to wait for opportunities that have been given to him um, by the way in which others, um, including the Western powers, have um, behaved, in, uh, including, I would say, in, in, in Syria, when he sent the Russian military into Syria in September of 2000. And, um, 15. This looks very different um, because it's much more reckless what he has done. I think it's true that he spent a, quite a lot of time preparing for this kind of war in terms of trying to protect Russia from sanctions, in terms of building up um, reserves, gold reserves for, for um, instance. But I'm not sure that he has, shall we say, judged well how far he can protect himself from the consequences of the kind of sanctions that are now coming in. Now, obviously, there's a big missing bit to the sanctions still around energy. Nothing that's happening is really hurting or decisively anyway hurting Russia's ability to export oil and gas and or indeed um, coal. But the sanctions that have come in against the oligarchs around Putin, I'd say, in principle, at the least, have got the potential to change the decision making incentives that those oligarchs have around Putin's power. I, I, I wouldn't want to predict that it is going to bring him down, but I, I would certainly say that there's a considerable element of hubris, to use your word, uh, uh, um, in what he's done, and that hubris. You know, after after hubris comes nemesis. Well, that was the academic and author there, Helen Thompson, explaining how world leaders can be brought down by their own excesses. Uh, and you can get her book, Disorder, uh, now. Let's just bring you some breaking news, because speaking in the last half hour, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has given a press conference with the French leader, Emmanuel Macron, and she announced new measures to wean Europe off of Russian gas. And she said, and let me just quote her here, by the end of May... 
We will propose to phase out our dependency on Russian gas, oil and coal by 2027. It will be backed by the necessary national and European resources and will present options to optimise the electricity market design so that it better supports the green transition. So real movement there from the EU 